Hi, I'm Larry Gifford. I have Parkinson's disease. This is when life gives you Parkinson's. For the month of April, Parkinson's Awareness Month, we're releasing one episode each week. As we continue our third season focus around advocacy, we're going to discuss the importance of participating in research. Two stories today that I want to tell you about. A quick five-minute chat about a repurposed drug that potentially is disease-altering. And another update on a story that we've been following here on the pod for several years now. The smell of Parkinson's. And, and could the smell of Parkinson's lead us to a biomarker? Claire Bale is the Head of Research Communications and Engagement for Parkinson's UK. Claire, welcome to the When Life Gives You Parkinson's podcast. Thank you so much. What a great time to be in the Parkinson's business. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. 2021, it's the year. That's right. Uh, well, I do feel like we're on the precipice of uh, like some really big breakthroughs. Do you feel that, Claire? I really hope, I hope so. I definitely have that feeling, you know, it's anticipation. There's lots of um, interesting research. It sort of feels like it's culminating and or getting to the point where we're going to find out whether it's going to fly or not. Well, and like the pipeline seems packed full too, where like if you look back 10, 15 years ago, you could look into the pipeline of research for Parkinson's and it'd be just a big echo chamber because there's nothing in there. Yeah, no, completely. I absolutely agree with that. My understanding is now the organization has... Uh, declared it will invest 1.2 million pounds into pioneering research aimed at developing a drug to protect my dopamine producing brain cells. Yep, that's right. This is um, a new project that's part of our virtual biotech uh, program. So this is a, the sort of drug development arm of the charity where we try and take great science that might be coming out of universities. It's a university in this case, um, but also companies and try and accelerate that progress and and help take the steps it needs to take towards developing a drug that can go forward to clinical trials. So now this sounds disease altering. Yeah, that's their hope. So this has come out of a, a, a research project we actually funded at the University of Sheffield, where they identified repurposed drugs, so drugs that already exist for other conditions, by screening them in um, cells taken from people with Parkinson's. And these drugs that they identified seem to be able to help restore mitochondrial function, the energy producing batteries of cells. Okay, so they're inside the, inside the dopamine producing brain cells. There's this thing called a mitochondria. That's the energy, that's the battery. And exactly. with, yeah. with people in Parkinson's, that battery is empty or broken yeah. or it's malfunctioning or... Yeah, and that causes all sorts of problems, not just that cells don't have enough energy, but also the mitochondria that don't work properly can be damaging to brain cells themselves. So there's lots of issues with mitochondria. So finding drugs that could address those problems holds a huge amount of hope uh, for protecting brain cells and potentially slowing or stopping Parkinson's. So they identified some existing drugs that seem to have those kinds of properties, but the problem was with some of them is that they had side effects that might make them unappealing for people with Parkinson's. So this project has started to look, can we use those existing drugs as almost like the starting point to develop even better drugs that are similar, but are hopefully more potent, so have stronger effects on the mitochondria and have less side effects. Can I ask so what those side effects might be? So there's, I think the side effects of the uh, existing drugs were things like vomiting. Um, and, you know, I can't remember any of the others off the top of my head. But You didn't like grow like a third ear or anything? No, I don't think there was anything like that. That would be, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, that might be a positive effect, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and also, you know, making sure that these drugs are, are brain penetrant so they can cross from the bloodstream into the brain as easily as possible, um, that means is obviously really important in Parkinson's. What exactly does it do to the mitochondria? Do you know? Uh, I'm not actually 100% clear on that, but certainly it, it seems to rescue the in, in the brain cells in a dish, it seems to rescue the deficits that you see um, in Parkinson's. So it's like sending a teacher in there to make it, to, to get it back on track. Yeah, little light, little so. life coach for the mitochondria. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. But there's there's lots of different ways that drugs can target mitochondria. So the the you know that might be all sorts of ways it might be helping. Now, what was it 
that convinced Parkinson's UK that, yeah, we want to invest in this? Well, we've done some preliminary work with Heather, who's the lead researcher from the University of Sheffield, and it's shown some really great promise. We've, we've already managed to create some drugs based on her initial findings that seem to seem to be goers, basically. They seem to be able to restore mitochondrial function, have fewer side effects, and it's going well. So we want to invest more money, try and take those new drugs forward, test them more rigorously, and ultimately get them to the next stage, which would be looking at testing in animals before they could go forward into clinical trials. Yeah, so that's a long process. So we're, we're looking for like, what, five years before any human could touch it, probably. Well, this this next stage of the process is a year's funding. We, the point of the virtual biotech program is really to make as much progress as quickly as possible. Um, so we put dedicated resources in place. We have drug discovery managers here at Parkinson's UK who work with the scientific team. And it means we can hopefully speed up that process. Fast track, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and get things moving as quickly as possible. So if this is successful, we'll probably need to do some further testing in the lab for, say, a year or two. And then maybe we'll be ready for early stage clinical trials. Well, I've been uh, titled The Woman Who Smells Parkinson's. Um, I, had, I have hereditary hyperosmia from my grandmother. Um, when Les was just about 32, his smell changed and um, it went from there. And Les was your husband who has since passed, but he it was diagnosed with Parkinson's. How long after you could smell a change? Well, 10 to 11 years, 11 years. It was 10, 11 years, really. Wow. We, we on this podcast have talked to Joy Milne and about Joy Milne and her nose, the woman who can smell Parkinson's. Uh, the research into why and how she can smell Parkinson's has evolved quite a bit and now paved the way for a simple skin swab test providing diagnosis for Parkinson's. Yep. Whoa, 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 whoa. Is this the elusive biobarker we've all been looking for? We hope so. Absolutely. So um, Joy actually has been working with researchers at the University of Manchester, like as part of the team. And they've been looking at the, the composition of, of sebum. Sebum is like the oily substance that coats our skin. And actually, it's been known for a while that there can be changes in how much sebum like people with Parkinson's produce. Um, but I think this is really the first time anyone's actually looked in detail at the composition of sebum. Like, are there changes in actually the chemicals that make up sebum? And... So the team have been working hand in hand with Joy to see, can they identify chemical changes in sebum that basically account for what Joy can smell? And so literally they've been like doing these experiments and, and holding things under Joy's nose at the same time and being like, we think this has gone up or down. And, and she goes, mm, yeah, that seems right. And um, what they've identified is there are around 10 different chemicals in sebum that seem to be either raised or lowered in people with Parkinson's compared to people without. And this seems to be like the chemical fingerprint or signature of Parkinson's that Joy is able to detect with her notes. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. It's such an amazing story. And not only does it seem to be able to distinguish people with Parkinson's from people without, with around 85% accuracy. So that's better than a normal diagnosis actually right oh well, yeah sure uh, uh, so it can do that but also they think it may even be able to track progression so they can see differences between people who've had parkinson's you know a short period of time say two years compared to people who've lived with it for longer um and again you know this is one of the holy grails is we have no way i mean in gdnf is a great example in clinical trials we can't tell is parkinson's getting worse is it getting better is it slowing down We've got no great way of measuring that. So it could be a really important step forward on multiple fronts, both for improving the diagnosis experience for people um, who are currently have a, have a real ordeal, but also as a research tool in the future for tracking the progression of Parkinson's. Thanks for all the work that you do uh, in, in, in helping the Parkinson's community and, and all, everything that Parkinson's UK does. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been really fun. I first encountered Joy Milne at the World Parkinson Congress in Kyoto. She was on the podcast October 2019, episode four of season two. I'll link it to the show notes. 
Recently, I sat down with Joy and Perdita Barron, professor of mass spectrometry at the University of Manchester. Purdy weighs molecules and interprets the data they produce. I start with Joy, and I ask her about the PD Avengers project she inspired called Sparks of Experience. It's um, taking our experience, um, people who've lived with Parkinson's and people with Parkinson's, and putting it down in all the little aspects, all the you know, sort of pitfalls, the highs, and making people aware, making people really aware of what Parkinson's is and why something urgently needs to be done about it. And I know research takes time, but... I mean, Perdi and the team have been fantastic. They have just continued and continued so that with every step we take, we found out more and there's more that can be done. And I think that is the way it should be done, that people realise exactly what a life with Parkinson's is, your family and how you cope with it. And it it would make people realise, it was like Johnny saying, um, passing somebody in the in the, the hospital. You know, Johnny Aitkinson, he's a consultant, a new man, and he was passing this man, and uh, the chap said to him, oh, you know, your arm's shaking. And he said, yes, I have Parkinson's. No, oh, but aren't you too young to have Parkinson's? So I think... The awareness for the general public is not there. It's like Matt Eagle saying, this chap was saying, well, he shouldn't be staggering around because he was drunk. Right. And I think that is the importance of having this, the work we're doing with Sparks of Experience. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think more than anything, it's notice what you notice and, and, and document it because, you know, you did, you told somebody it has a smell. And then, every, and then over time, people are like, Oh, yeah, I knew that. But they just assume yeah. everybody just assumes everybody's aware of everything. And we, we need everybody to contribute to that. Right. Yes. Like we need that whole, you know, because the more information we have from the people who are living with Parkinson's, whether you're you diagnosed with it or your partner is the, 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 the more we can do this type of work. Perdita has been fascinated with Joy's super smeller since the day Joy stood up at a meeting and asked researcher Tilo Kunith why he wasn't researching the smell of Parkinson's. After confused looks and some more explaining, Tilo figured out what she was talking about and told Perdita. They later decided to test Joy's nose. There were some very exciting things in the, in the proof of principle experiment that we did, which was set up by Tilo, um, but we were involved to to make sure that Joy wasn't just seeing people who, who had symptoms of Parkinson's and associating the smell. And the experiment was to make some people who had Parkinson's wear T-shirts and, and some people who didn't have Parkinson's um, wear the same type of T-shirt and, and then to take the T-shirts from them and, and put them all in sealed bags and take them to Joy to, to get her to smell them. And um, she was completely correct in, in, in every case, um, and except for one who was someone who she said had Parkinson's, but they were in the control group. And as it happened, about nine months afterwards, that person came back and told Tilo that um, indeed they had been diagnosed. So I think that was a, that was a really extraordinary point because not only did it show that she could do this you know, and she really was right. It wasn't a false positive. It was a true positive, right? So, so analytically, that was incredible. But but again, she could do it before someone had been clinically diagnosed. But the really exciting thing, if I may say, I mean, you know, so that work was just fantastic. But the actually really exciting thing for us about it was that the odour was not in the armpits of the individuals, which is where we thought it had been. And I had a student, a lovely student who was there at the time, the Brazilian, who I'd made strap gauze to his armpits and run up and down the Pentland Hills to, to see if we could, you know, develop a mass spectrometry method of extracting these. And anyway, Joy said, no, no, the smell is not strong in the armpits. It was strong in the middle of the back underneath the neckline. And 
that led us to know where we should look for the odour or the diagnostic molecule because mass spectrometers don't smell. <laughs> they, just look, <laughs> they just look at molecules. Um, and so the place that we then went on to swab from people and then find out what it was, well, is there. So we swab people around their, around their neckline, between their shoulder blades, that area. Of that. Which is the area that uh, when you're off your meds or or you're you're in an off period, or it's a get at the end of the day is of uh, my as my son says, Dad, you're all sweaty, but it's oh, not yeah. just sweat. It's, it's actually sebum, and sebum is a is a an you know, oily substance which is really rich in in triglycerides and squalene and lipids, and it's there to kind of keep our skin lubricated. We have it everywhere except for the palms of our hands, except we do have it on the palms of our hands because we touch our face and so we get it, it transfers, um, and we don't have it on the soles of our feet. Um, and, we, and we have less of it under our armpits, actually, as it happens. And, and it, 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 of course, the middle of our back, for, for all of us, but perhaps particularly for, for a lot of people with Parkinson's, it's a very difficult place to wash. So it is also the part of our body where that substance accumulates the most because we're not washing it. So now we've gone from smelling Parkinson's to putting sebum on a cloth. And then what did you find when you did that? We literally just take the gauze, we wipe medical gauze, just regular medical gauze on someone's back of their neck, between their shoulder blades. And we, we take that gauze and we press it in a tube and we just heat it up a little bit. We just heat the tube up to help the molecules that are on the gauze the duct, to, to come off. And we then send them through something called a, a, a um, column. And that column is, is a tube and it's got some sticky stuff on the inside. And depending on what molecules are there, they will stick or, or not to the sticky stuff. And so this starts to separate the, the molecules. And just to give you an idea of how many molecules are released from the gauze, there are on the order of 600 that we wow. can easily identify in anyone, right? in anyone. So there's a lot of stuff there that comes off this, this course. And so you heat it up, you send it through the tube to start to separate it. And then at the end of the tube, you divert a little bit of it to the mass spectrometer where you weigh it. And that helps you to know what it is. And in this particular mass spectrometer, you send a lot of it to a thing called an odor port. Um, and the odor port is where someone who's a professional knows, and that's the technical term, <laughs> the nose, fit and smell. And, and that's the experiment that we did with Joy. So we designed this experiment so that she could code the compounds as if they smelled, uh, it, to tell us whether they were the ones that to her smelled to Parkinson's. So that was what we did. Um, and so... We did that experiment actually in a, we didn't have exactly that instrument in my lab, we do now. So we did it at a, um, a collaborator, a company that had that instrument. And it's principally sold to the perfume industry and to the food and drink industry where people want to detect the lovely aromas in coffee or the not very nice aromas if someone's used the wrong oak for their whiskey barrel or something. So so it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's used for those sorts of reasons. And um and so, yeah, so we were there with Joy and she was able to, and I remember it, I will never forget this. And the, the, we were seeing the, we were seeing the compounds coming off. Joy was in a rather meditative state, smelling as the compounds came off the column and went to the mass spectrometer or to her nose, same time. And she was pressing a button if they smelt like yes. And that's what she said. She said, oh. It smells like less. It smells like less. And it was extra it was just like there was electricity in the air. It was extraordinary. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of when we started to find out what it was and, and proved that indeed not only did Parkinson's have an odor, um, but also that we could measure it. Um, and that was exciting. <laughs> Joy, what was that experience like for you? Um, we walked back out of the lab and into a room and I I, was, I couldn't sit down. I was so excited. I was really, uh, it was, it was immense, Larry. It really was. It felt fantastic. But that was how long ago? Five years. Yeah. Five. 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 So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So what's happened in the last five years? We did a lot more of those experiments and we also had to, get participants so we engaged but well, we got some research funding first of all from parkinson's uk 
um, and then from the Michael J. Fox found, uh, Michael J. Fox organization. And we recruited patients and we thought initially we would recruit 300 because that seemed like statistically a good number. Um, we would get about 150 with Parkinson's and about 100 that were drug naive. So people who just been diagnosed because we wanted, going back to Les, to see how early we could detect it. And ethically, we couldn't go earlier than that. The minute some hospitals and neurologists started hearing what we were doing, um, more hospitals want to take part. And so now we've sampled from 1,800 participants, which is um, amazing. In fact, Joy, just the other day, because we just had a, a lovely paper that came out, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, someone emailed me and he said, I was one of the participants, <laughs> which is really terrible. He couldn't tell me that. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, because ethically I'm not meant to know. But anyway, it was really a lovely email. And, and, and the person said that they were delighted to have contributed. And, but anyway, so we spent some time recruiting people and developing methods. And it took us a bit of time because sebum, this oily substance we have on our skin, is, is just not really, no one's really looked at it much. So there weren't really go-to methods for analysing the components of sebum. So we had to really start at the beginning and, and, and work out how to do it. Um, but it's been good. <laughs> That's been a good journey. The tests continued and continued and continued with joy and the sebum. The process has now become much more elegant and enlightening. One of the things we did, the first experiments really were to do the same as Joy's nose and to look at those volatile compounds. The next experiments were to look at other compounds and see them from people with Parkinson's versus people without, with a method of mass spectrometry that just allowed us to identify the molecules better than the thermal desorption one. Um, there are reasons for that, and it's mainly that the Thermal desorption mass spectrometry method breaks the molecules up, so we only see little bits of them. We don't; it's quite hard to identify what they are. So we needed to use a method that was more gentle to get them into the mass spectrometer. Um, so we did that first of all with a technique called LCMS, where we where we it's more gent we put them in more gently, and in doing that, and, and we've just published a beautiful paper on this, we've been able to find out not only more um, diagnostic compounds, but also compounds that show how the cells in people's bodies are changing as the disease progresses. And so we're able to see that uh, actually the, 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 the mitochondria, these little batteries in our cells that help to produce energy for our body, they just can't work as well. And they and they can't work as well. They're not they're not able to work as well. And one of the reasons they're not able to work as well is because there are that the ability to get long chain fatty acids, which are big long hydrocarbon molecules, into them is just being shut down by the progression of the disease. So we started to see that, which is really like I never thought we'd find out that kind of detail about what's going on in people with Parkinson's from just skin swaps. Right. So that we're really pleased with that, but. What we really want to do is to design a quick assay that can be used easily in, in, in hospital labs to allow people to be diagnosed, but also to allow the effects of treatment or, or um, therapy, hopefully positive, but not always positive, on the individual to be monitored. And so to do that, we needed to develop something that was... Um, quick and easy and, and, and really showed um, a lot. And, and that's what um, Deepan Jan Sarkar, who's a postdoctoral fellow in our group, came from Calcutta. Um, that's what he's developed. And, and he's done two beautiful things. He, he, he's, he said, we don't need to have much separation in the front end. We just need to take a bit of paper. You can actually take a bit of paper and rub it on someone's back, which is amazing. But you can take a Q-tip and rub it on some paper, which works a little bit better in terms of what we transfer. And then you, you, you have this paper and you make it into a triangle and you add a little bit of solvent to it and then you hold it close to the mass spectrometer and you just look at the sebum that comes off. So there's no nothing, you don't do anything else. You just wipe some paper on someone's back or rub, rub a Q-tip on someone's back, put the molecules on the paper, push it in. And then you can see not only the different compounds directly from the sebum that exist in people with Parkinson's are not, but also the complexity of the different compounds. And I think that's a really amazing, and I think that's what Joy is referring to. And so we do, and that process only takes two minutes. I mean, the whole process takes five minutes from swabbing someone's back 
to, to getting the results. And so that's really transformative. And so we're now developing that into a, an assay that could be of clinical utility so that it can be used in, in, in hospital clinics. So how soon until that's being used in hospitals? Larry, that's a million dollar question and it might take a million dollars for us to do it, but we're, but that's what we're working on. So if I had a million dollars, um, we would be able to do it in the next one to three years. And we are always applying for funding. And I um, I hope we will get a million dollars over the next one to three years. Um, and really what, what I've done over the last couple of years is form really good links with, with clinical mass spectrometrists. So I'm a academic mass spectrometrist and, and, and we've done a, we're taking this to a, to a stage and now we need to make it really robust. We need to make it something that will be absolutely reliable. We need to have um, reference standards that are similar to these compounds and the trouble with that is they're really different from things that people have looked at before. They're much bigger. Um, no one's really looked at these sorts of skin lipids before. In theory though, it wouldn't just diagnose Parkinson's. What if you could use it to diagnose COVID? So amazingly, we've done some work in that. And I did it with a, exactly the same method that we've, we've done for, for, for Parkinson's um, with a collaborator at the University of Surrey. Um, we had a, a manuscript published on this just, just last week. And um, it's really good. It really works. It really, really works for COVID too. And, and with that study, we had more clinical information than we did with our Parkinson's study um, and we were able to distinguish people who had COVID from people who didn't have COVID but also people who had COVID and type 2 diabetes from people who didn't have COVID and had type 2 diabetes which is really important particularly for that disease because there are, you know, the underlying risk factors are, are there. Um, so also we have Joy's Nihilus an awful lot to thank because it's kind of opened a world into we call it sibomics, right? The, the ohm of, of sebum and, and what we might do from it. All right, Joy, how, how are you feeling now? I, I had a little bit of a blip. I, I um, became quite emotional about it. I really thought, my God, you know, I mean, it, it's what Perdi says. We really never, ever expected to see the lipids as they do and and to find out what is happening in the body because that's the only way a treatment, a proper treatment will be found. It has opened a huge, big window for Parkinson's. Joy, are we going to market this as like joy in a box or... <laughs> Joyful smell, or what? 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 what have you have you thought of the brand names, or the, the brand extensions? Joy underarm deodorant, even though it's not about the underarms, I know, but that's okay. Well, we have our, we we do have a saying: nose to diagnose, don't we, Perdy? <laughs> yeah, our, our our pet name for the project is nose to diagnose. That is, awesome. um, but but uh, <laughs> t-shirts. I went with Joy on a t-shirt. It's like, did you smell that? <laughs> uh, so I, I have a question for you joy if you wouldn't have been told by less to keep going would you have oh yes i looking back now i mean i i met les when i was 16 so we were going out when we were really quite young and we, we did a lot of hill walking and stuff. And we had that sort of rapport with three boys and all going fine. You know, he had got his consultants. He was the first consultant in his class, in fact. Um, so we were, and then all of a sudden things began to change. Just little by little. And Rebecca would know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it's that sort of you've all, you've got somebody who you know, and then they begin to change. And I feel that I can help that. You know, if your your medication is better, if you're you perhaps diagnosed a bit earlier, your exercise, everything else, yes. I would want people to have that chance that Les and I didn't have. Did Les know 
what you didn't know per data? That he, did he know that there was that this was going to lead to something? Is that because it seems like he had some sort of intuition like this is it? I think both Joy and Les were, I think they kind of knew there must be something in it for two reasons. One, because they're brilliant um, diagnosticians, right? That was their job. That was their, that was their life. And, and two, because Joy smelt it so early, right? You know, this was a massive life event for them. And God knows, you know, happening age eight, when, when Les was, was 44 diagnosis, but actually, right, lots of symptoms before then. So, so to sort of have that major trauma in, in your life and then live with it and live with it, then I think they probably inhabited what could happen or what, what might happen from this for a long time. Um, there's many other people who have written to me and, and, and my colleagues and said that, like Joy, they smelt their partner or their husband or their, or their father or mother or whatever. And, and, and um, one of the most remarkable was a hairdresser who said she had a client who, you know, hairdressers, they're around the back of the neck. And she, she had a client who, who smell changed. And then years afterwards, the client told her. So my, she wrote kept, to me and, my wife kept throwing out my shirts. Okay. Okay. Right. So there you go. Yeah. Same. Same. Yeah. It is often women, actually. It's often women who write to us. And I, I, I think that's interesting. But anyway, Joy and Les, encouraged by Les, they were the people who knew and did enough and had enough, you know, just put to go and to go and talk to scientists about it. Keep talking to us. It's about really it. amazing. Uh, and Joy, you are such a, such a joy for this <laughs> Parkinson's community. Like what would we do without you? Now you've got to thank my grandmother for giving it to me, you know. <laughs> the hereditary thing. <laughs> I have a question, actually, which I, which is a little bit like your question about Les, but I have a question to Joy that I've never asked her before. So something that she didn't say, but I will say, is that she is an active member of our research team, right? I mean, I think you know that, but she's, a, she's both an honorary lecturer at the University of Manchester and also uh, a postdoctoral researcher, albeit part-time um, and remote at the moment <laughs> at the University of Manchester. And um, and would, what would have Les thought of that, Joy? Of your, uh, you know, she now has three published papers and uh, what would he thought of that? Um, I think he would be uh, pleased. I think he would be very pleased. Yes, because, I mean, he knew... Um, when I did my lecturing in nursing and this started, I have that uh, frame of mind of um, preventative care. When the mm -hmm. white paper came out in Britain, um, I was one of the first lecturers in the ENB group to actually do the training. And, and, um, and preventative care is very much my way of looking at medicine. So, and he was the same. You know, he um, taught anaesthetists, um, anaesthetic nurses. He was the first doctor um, to actually believe in um, anaesthetic nurses and technicians. Mm -hmm. And he was the first to do lectures mm -hmm. in, for them. And he set up the course in Liverpool. And I think that that's the way we were. We want what yeah. we had. We wanted to always explore. You kept questing. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. No, I, I think I think he would be very proud. How valuable is it to have people with Parkinson's or care partners involved with research at the scientific level as a partner, as opposed to a patient? I think it's critical, um, and I think in the case of any chronic disease, it's particularly critical because. The person who's your partner is, is, is to an extent the person who will see it from the outside. You know, I think I think both experiences are, are extremely useful. Having having patient input to what we are doing or to what happens in any medical project is useful. But I think having that 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 knowledge from the person who sees it from from the outside, I think, but but, but close outside is is extremely helpful too. And, um, I'm very grateful to the partners of people who've written to us. Oftentimes. You know, thanking us, thank you, Joy, for for showing something that, or for doing something with something that they noticed too, right? And and I think that that is one of the things about her story that really resonates with people is that she she, she observed, she observed, she smelt, 
something was happening with Les observed what was happening and she did something about it. And I think that was a great example. Um, and she helps us all the way along. <laughs> so how has that changed your perspective of how you listen to patients and caregivers? I don't get that much opportunity to, to, to listen to patients, I think. But in general, the response we've had from people who have Parkinson's and, and things people have said to me, what I've been overwhelmed by is how positive people are about what we're doing, you know, how, how grateful, but, but how interested they are in it and how they really feel that this could be, like you said, biomarkers could really help. Has the scientific community been as positive? Well, not always. We've had some journal editors who've not been quite as interested as others, I would say, but it's getting better. It's getting better. Good. Well, let me know how I can help. We do have the PD <laughs> Avengers and we will uh, we will <laughs> gather steam behind you and uh, push our way forward. <laughs> now, I think it's the more we, you know, now we've published um, three papers and that's really, you know, so that's becoming a body of work. <laughs> well, uh, I'm really proud of uh, all the work that you guys are doing. And as somebody who has Parkinson's, um, Thank you for dedicating your lives to this because this is this is remarkable. And this, you know, I, I, I've been saying this I, as I talk to different researchers and heads of organizations. 2021 really feels like the year of the biomarker. Like mm. this is one of them. But there yeah. are like three or four that are on the precipice right now of just falling over the edge and saying, bam, here we are. And mm. with that, then we have a way to measure if we can stop things and, and go to the next level until yeah. we get the mile markers down, we can't do that. So the fact that you guys have spent the last five years focused on this. Um, thank you. Thank you. Oh, pleasure. <laughs> thank you. It's our pleasure. And we keep going as well. <laughs> Just yeah. beginning. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we, uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, in Barcelona, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh. That will be fun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Although for Joy, walking through a convention center with a thousand or more people with Parkinson's may just be cruel and unusual punishment. But I want you to take a lesson from what Joy has taught us. Her sparks of experience may have just led us to our first biomarker. What will your sparks of experience bring to the Parkinson's community? Observe what you observe. Notice what you notice. Write down things and ask lots of questions. Share data. Share your observations. The sparks of experience are only things people with Parkinson's and their care partners can provide. You can't learn that in a classroom. You have to experience it. That's where we come in. This is When Life Gives You Parkinson's, a Curious Cast podcast. Our story producer is Dila Velazquez, sound designed by Rob Johnson. The presenting partner is Parkinson Canada. Diagnosed with Parkinson's? You're not alone. Parkinson.ca. Be sure to check out their No Matter What campaign for April's Parkinson's Awareness Month. Thanks also to our promotional partners, PD Avengers, a global alliance of people with Parkinson's, our partners and friends, standing together to demand change in how the disease is seen and treated. Join now at pdavengers.com, pdavengers.com. The Michael J. Fox Foundation Parkinson's Podcast, hosted by me, Larry Gifford, available on Apple Podcasts and at michaeljfox.org. Spotlight YOPD, the only organization in the world with the singular focus of raising awareness of young onset Parkinson's disease. You can find them at spotlightyopd.org. And the World Parkinson Congress 2022 in Barcelona, Spain. <laughs> Barcelona! And coming up in May of this year, 2021, WPC Virtual, Access Amazing Talks, and mine. <laughs> you can, I'm not going to say it's amazing, but it's pretty spectacular. Uh, it's on how to have a work life balance as a YOPD with a family and a career. Go to WPC2022.org for details. Tickets, just $25. You can register today. Thank you for listening. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, or wherever you listen to podcasts. While you're there, if you can, give the show a five-star rating and feel free to comment. You can also check us out on social media. It's at Parkinson's Pod 
on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or you can email us, parkinsonspod at curiouscast.ca. Have a very, very good Parkinson's Awareness Month. Keep positive, keep exercising, keep listening. We'll talk to you next time. Canada may be known for its landscapes and friendly people, but beneath the surface lies a darker side of crime, history, and the paranormal. Since 2017, the award-winning Dark Poutine podcast has explored the shadowy corners of the Great White North and beyond, delivering chilling tales from a uniquely Canadian perspective. Hosted by Mike Brown and Matthew Stockton with over 300 episodes and fresh releases every Monday, Dark Poutine is your weekly ticket to the creepier side of Canada. Listen to Dark Poutine on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts.